And um, somebody see if that's working too. Romans chapter 3, we're going to read verses 19 through the end of the chapter. And um, this is the first message of the 2019 Sanctification by Sovereign Grace Conference. And the title of this message is called uh, Cheap Law. And you'll see as we go along what we're talking about. It's going to be ended up, we're going to deal with that in verse 31. Let's look at verse 19. Verse 19. But we know that whatever things the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So there's, right off the bat, it shows the purpose of the law, to show guilt. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law is the knowledge of sin. But now a righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ toward all and upon all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness through the passing by of the sins that had taken place before in the forbearance of God for the display of His righteousness at this time for Him to be just and the justifier of Him which believes in Jesus. Then where is boasting? It is excluded. Through what law? Of works? No, no but through the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. Or is, God, uh, or is he the God of the Jews only and not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since it is one God who will um, justify circumcision by faith, and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, but we establish the law. Um, what I've noticed over the years, and I don't know if you all have run this test. I've done it before in person, and I've done it before in social media, where you declare God's gospel of free and sovereign grace. You put it out there in its clarity, boldness, and it's just the personal work of Christ. And you're not talking about anything else, nothing, what, not, not what we do with it, but you declare and lay out the glorious gospel with nothing added. And often we get that natural response. And it, and it could be in two ways. It could be naturally like, maybe because of ignorance, and it's maybe the first time they're hearing it in clarity and boldness, but you get this response that's, but, but, uh, however, don't you have to do this and that? And they're referring to certain conditions that you have to fulfill, because when you lay the gospel out, it's like, it can't be that free. It can't be that free. And people are taught maybe in the wisdom of their parents, that if something seems too good to be true, it's probably not true. Well, this is different. This is different here. The other response, naturally, might be of uh, hatred and resistance, not in ignorance, but in non-submission, with their but, but, however, and they want to add something to the gospel. And so when we stick to our guns, so to speak, and say, no, that's not the gospel. Additions are not part of the gospel. It's, here's the gospel. And it's not 
Uh, it's not the gospel when you add conditions. And when we say that and stick to that consistently, um, we get this accusation or label of antinomianism, which means against the law. Or there's another phrase, sometimes they might call what we preach uh, cheap grace because we haven't done anything to attain it, maintain it, or whatever. Cheap grace. So should we really be surprised that the offense of the cross actually offends? Um, I, you know, I think sometimes along the line we, we, we get re-surprised all the time and we forget about total depravity and the reaction of people that are actually offended by the gospel of, of God's grace. And also, we'll, we'll run into, as, as periodically throughout your time in your Christian life, uh, probably most of you have experienced this, we'll run into doctrinal issues as we're growing and learning. And we're going to run into these issues that make us stop and realize that we're not on the same page as some people that are even using the same terms. And um, when it comes to meaning, what do these terms mean? And for me, and, and probably you, you would think this is the case with everybody, the elementary one that um, should have started early on is this idea of conditional salvation. You being able to identify a salvation that's conditioned on the sinner because when we're converted, we have come out of that. That's the first that we repent of, you know, trying to condition salvation on ourselves in any way at all. So as you grow and learn, you see that clearer. You can see it further away. You catch it faster. And um, so the, the vast majority of people who claim to be and hold to uh, sovereign grace, Calvinistic reform teaching, they make claims that they were actually converted under a system of conditional salvation. They'll look back to and they say, yeah, I don't believe that now, but I was converted back there. I believed the gospel, even though it was laden with conditions and works and things like this, things that I had to do to fulfill uh, certain conditions to be acceptable. And um, they would say because they possessed um, what they would call a progressive sanctification, they progressed in their knowledge and they came into the truth later. And they finally saw that salvation was of the Lord later. Uh, there's variations of how that's said, but I've heard that for years. All the while, they'll look back, you know, on their what we consider false conversion, look back on it with fond memories in their old religion. They'll talk about it. They'll count it as their seniority. They'll put it on their religious resume, in other words. And um, so that's something that we recognize. And that's the first thing I recognized after being converted. The second thing I recognized, and I don't know why it took me so long, Maybe because of the subtlety, it's nothing I fell for, but it's something that I saw coming out from people using our terms, is the difference in the meaning among those claiming to be so-called Calvinists on another important doctrine and its sanctification. And this is almost even scarier because it's subtle. It's sometimes undetectable unless you force people, what do you mean when you say that? And usually it'll come out, and it's clear what they mean. And um, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm sure the other speakers will be hitting on that here and there. Um, but the idea there of those two things, I want you to see how those match. If they believe that they're initially saved in a conditional system, all they've done is brought that conditional system on over to sanctification and they've finished out their thoughts in a continual conditional salvation to the end. So they'll um, maybe often defend that statement, you know, go against it by saying, 
Scott, we're talking about sanctification. We're not talking about justification. As if it's not even related to salvation. I mean, is not sanctification part of salvation? So over the years, uh, also as you, you know, been converted and you kind of look at the the landscape of doctrine, you go to different churches, you try to find people that believe what you believe, and it's really, really hard. You start to see a downgrade, a downgrade in doctrine, and a sliding back toward Rome's doctrine. The sinner uh, cooperates. Um, this is this is called synergism. Technically, some of the theologians use that phrase. Rome's teaching of infused righteousness. This is their idea of salvation. They infuse God infuses righteousness into a person with enabling graces, and the sinner cooperates with the Spirit to do well enough to be considered a saint in the end. And um, what they do is they make justification depend on how well sanctification has progressed. Does that sound familiar? I'm not even talking about Catholics right now. This is the point. This is why I'm bringing it up. So what they do is they emphasize a personal holiness and a personal righteousness. And um, that is distinct from Christ's righteousness and Christ's holiness that we have. So I'm afraid some of uh, these people that use our terms have taken on some of Rome's ideas. And uh, so this, I just want to let you know right off the bat, this is not just some abstract theological exercise as we talk about these. It's not just something cool, you just little tidbit you learn and put it on a shelf and forget it. This relates to the gospel. And this affects our state of mind as children of God. It affects our relation to assurance, our peace, and our joy. I don't know how many like assurance, peace, and joy. But if you don't have assurance, peace, and joy, well, I know people that have killed themselves. And I've talked to people that were about to kill themselves and gave them the gospel, and they backed off. That's how far this can go. That's how important it is. And if you don't kill yourself, you can live the rest of your life in misery if you want. If you're going to tolerate these things that will affect your view that are directly connected to the gospel, have fun with that. I'm not going to do it. I'm protective of it. And our members know about these issues. And we guard these things because they're precious to us. <clears throat> so our purpose here in this conference is to glorify God by showing that sanctification, just like all of salvation from start to finish, is by God's sovereign grace. So let's look at a few things in this text here. Let's start in verse 23, Romans 23. You guys go ahead and take a seat. Just feel free. And Romans 3.23. When I was a um, little self-righteous uh, boy in Sunday school, this was my first memory verse. I had no idea what it meant, but I think I won something for memorizing it. Or being the first one to turn to it or something, you know, the old sword drills. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, a lot of people will use this in the Romans road system when they're trying to do this altar call sinner's prayer. One, two, three, repeat after me. It's in the little track, you know, that, you know, you read this. Yeah, I agree with that. You go to the next one. Yeah, I agree with that. You know how it goes. You, some of you have been there. But I, I don't want us to skim over what this is saying here. Uh, the perfect standard of God here in this verse is clearly set forth. And it's talking about a person. The Lord Jesus Christ is the glory of God. So that's who all have fallen short of is Christ. He's the standard. We know that um, 
God the Father in his uh, eternal, unchangeable wisdom saw fit to choose this one. He said in Isaiah 42, one, my elect in whom my soul delights. He's the glory of God, the person of Christ. He chose his son. We know he was the only one qualified, passed by the angels. There was no options. It was his son, the glory of God that he chose in reference to fulfilling his purpose in glorifying himself from, in redemption. So we're going to start getting into, we're going to start seeing what is this sanctification thing all about. There's, it's a Trinitarian sanctification. And the first part is um, the Father's part in sanctification. When he appointed Christ to be the representative and surety of his people in the covenant of grace. He did at least two things that we know of. There's more, I'm sure, but there's at least two that are going to be standing out that have to do with the Father sanctifying people before time. First, he set his affection on these people by loving them in Christ. That is the way he set them apart or sanctified them from others that he did not. And let me stress, he did it in Christ. Conditioned on Christ, because of Christ, for Christ's sake, all these things, it's in Christ. Secondly, he set these people apart by electing them in Christ. He loved them. This is, this is foreknowledge in like Romans 8, for example. And then those that he loved, he elected unto salvation. And this also, as we read in many different texts, is in Christ. So nothing and nobody uh, can stop his hand here or have the authority to say, what are you doing? Just like it says in Daniel 4.35. In other words, this part of sanctification is done. It's already done. You can't affect it. You can't touch it. God did it. Effectually, it's done. So we see we, the first glimpse here of sanctification by sovereign grace, done by the Father. And let's be careful to notice exactly this point I want to drive home again of who has the preeminence in love and election. It's Christ. There's a banner in the back. It's a quote from Colossians 1.18 that in all things he might have preeminence. All things. Creation, providence, election, love, all of it. He's preeminent in all things. And the Father saw fit in his sovereignty to set him forth in preeminence, especially in salvation, where he's concerned chiefly with his glory. So we'll see that pattern throughout in all three aspects using the Trinity that Christ has preeminence in all three. Look at our text here in... Um, Let's go to verse 24 there. I want us to see, start to see the second glimpse of sanctification by sovereign grace dealing with the Son of God. Verse 24, this is some good gospel stuff here. Being justified, notice, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For sake of time, I mean, you could camp out here and spend all kind of time. But, you know, as in our former religion, we might have blew by these verses and just, you know, this person with this name called Christ that we didn't know because we had another Christ in our imagination, he was just pretty much a stepping stone that we could step on to do our thing to say that we're saved, you know, by, again, conditions. But th this is packed with so many things. Justification is, is a major tenet of the gospel. You can't have the gospel without this doctrine of justification. Um, I've heard uh, decent preachers talk about the gospel of justification. Notice it's freely given. Um, it's sovereignly freely given. God is not, his arm is not being twisted to give it because he's sovereign. It's freely given in reference to it's not charged to us, like we don't buy it. And it's through grace. And, and all this language through here is consistent. 
There's no, there's no deviations. There's no scratching your head at any of these verses here. And so, okay, we're going down a different road. We're doing conditions that changed from grace to works. It's not. It's all grace all through here. It's clear. Verse 25, whom God, here again, again, he set forth, setting forth, talking about Christ, a propitiation. That word simply means a satisfaction of God's law and justice that will hold back his wrath through faith in his blood, in his blood, the merit of his blood. What did his blood accomplish? What did it mean? What did it do? What did it demand? This propitiation. And so the result is to declare his righteousness through the passing by of the sins that have been taken place before in the forbearance of God. Let me just say one thing about propitiation real quick, that term. And don't be afraid of that term. I know it's not an everyday thing that they don't talk about on the nightly news, right? Um, you don't talk about it at work in reference to your job. This is something that needs to be exercised and explained to people. You need to start using this word more and um, at least define what it is and use those other words to describe what it is if you think it would scare people by just the simple name of it. Think of um, <clears throat> this, this word and the definition of it. It has to be particular to retain its definition. Some people would run to 2 John 2.1 and they would say, talks about the propitiation. He's, not, he's a propitiation for our sins, not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And they would claim that it's universal propitiation. So you go to them and you say, okay, so propitiation, what it is, it's an actual satisfaction of God's law and justice. So you're saying that that is actually done for the whole world. And if it is, the whole world's going to be saved. And then if you're saying, no, it's for the whole world and some go to hell, then you're showing a propitiation that's not really a propitiation. Sure. You can do the same thing with imputation of sin. You can do the same thing with the idea of substitution, which is the most elementary. So they have a substitution that doesn't substitute, a propitiation that doesn't propitiate, an imputation that doesn't impute. You go on and on and on. This, <clears throat> this is just simple language. But when people turn on their religion, they just want to toss out real meanings and, and, you know, reason and logic and truth, more importantly, truth. So this is something that worked, in other words, is what I'm getting at. Verse 26, for the display of his righteousness. God's always showing stuff, you know. He, he enjoys this, so he wants to show it, right? At this time, for him to be just and the justifier, which believe in Jesus. So throughout these three verses, we see zero conditions on man's part. And the only thing we see is effectual redemption displayed here. It's effectual. It's going to work. His one act of obedience established an absolute perfect righteousness to be imputed to his sheep for their justification. So again, freely, no works, no condition. It's apart from man's doing. And he justifies by his grace. We're very familiar with you. I have to turn there. Romans 5.21 clearly says that since we're talking about grace, grace reigns through righteousness. And this is the righteousness that Christ came and established. He worked out. He brought it in. And this is the merit of his whole work that is to be charged to, imputed to, reckoned to, legally transferred to the account of his people that he loved and elected. And that's how grace reigns. Grace cannot reign any other way. It won't and it can't. And God knows what he's doing and he's wise in this situation. And then again, people might already say, well, Scott, everything you've talked about, you're talking about justification, you're not talking about sanctification. Look, what I mean, look at the verses that we've looked at. We've just 
just glanced at a few. Cannot you see what the death of Christ has actually done to set people apart? If you haven't seen that yet, (laughs) you have not been listening or you can't hear. So his death actually accomplished something in setting people apart. He sanctified them. He, if, if you believe in the universal atonement, I guess you can't see this. It wouldn't make sense that he set anybody apart. If he died for everybody, he really didn't set anybody apart. You set yourself apart by being smart enough to believe and the other guy's dummy he goes to hell. I'm being sarcastic. It doesn't work that way. Let's be clearer with our language here. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. If people are not convinced that the death of Christ didn't set anybody apart, Hebrews 10 is probably one of the most clearest in the Word of God concerning that point. Verse 9. Then he said, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first... It's referring to the the, uh, Old Covenant. That he may establish the second, the New Covenant. And and of course, what we know he does that with his blood, right? By this will, we are sanctified, notice, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all time. I added the for time on there. Once and for all, and it means for all time. Um. And we know that because he said it's finished. He doesn't have to repeat it like the old covenant priests did. Um, so once and for all time, he, he succeeded. It doesn't have to be redone because it's done right the first time. It's effectual. <coughs> Notice verse 11, and indeed every priest stands daily ministering, talking about old covenant priest, offering the same sacrifices. Notice this for the dispensationalist which can never take away sins. But this man, referring to the God-man, after he had offered one sacrifice, that's all he needs, for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. That's another reason we know that it's once and for all time. He was done. He sat down. Nobody's ever done that before. In the Old Covenant, the reason they have to kept going back and keep standing up, the work was not done, right? From then on, expecting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Now, do you think Christ's death had anything to do with sanctifying his people? It's pretty clear. So he, he, his effectual sacrifice completely, and I, and I use that word completely for a reason, because of what it means, right? Completely satisfied God's law and justice against his elect. So in other words, there's nothing left of his wrath and of his law and justice that can be used as an accusation or a charge. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Right? There's other verses that say, uh, like in Colossians 1, it says that through the body of his death, that he is able to present these people, and I can never remember them, it's three things, unblameable, unreprovable, and unchargeable, I think I got it right, in his sight. Do you see the effect of that? Success. It's real. It happened. It's done. It's finished. And what did it do? It set those people apart. You cannot get away from that. And Christ again. Of course, he's the one performing it, so he obviously has preeminence here. So this work that Christ did for his people, and we're transitioning to the third part, the work of the Spirit. That work for his people enabled the Spirit to come in each generation and work in his people. We know that the spirit is life because of righteousness. Because that righteousness was established, that's the ground upon where the spirit can come in and work in his people. So this happens in the context, in time, in the context of uh, God 
giving his sheep spiritual life. And there's many different ideas and things that scripturally we can see. Uh, you know, regeneration is an obvious one. That's, a, that's an actual uh, resurrecting them from their spiritual death that they are in. It's a spiritual resurrection. Uh, the Spirit of God indwells them. The Spirit of God reveals Christ to them, gives them an understanding that they may know Christ. Um, the Spirit of God works faith and repentance in them. He doesn't offer faith. He works it in them. It says with such power that it's the same power that it took to raise Christ from the dead. You're not going to resist that. I mean, by the time that happens, it's too late. <laughs> right? He seals them. He guides them. The Spirit's the guide for life. The Spirit's doing that. Uh, he works in them both to will and do of his good pleasure. He grows them in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, what this is saying, just to cap it off, it's all spiritual blessings in Christ. Everything that the cross earned, the Spirit takes and dispenses to all the children of God throughout each generation. It's all the spiritual blessings that he freely gives. <clears throat> so, does this effectual, irresistible work of the Spirit seem to leave room for anybody or anything to be bragged about that they did to make a difference to become set apart or sanctified? So far, I don't see any of that. And we've already we've, we've just covered the third aspect of sanctification by sovereign grace, and we dealt with all three persons of the Trinity. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. And let's look at, skip down to verse 27 there in our text of Romans 3. <clears throat> then where is boasting? It's excluded. Through what law? This word law here means principle. Through what principle? The principle of works? No. But through the law or principle of faith. There's no boasting. It's excluded. So faith looks to Christ, and I'm sure some of these guys are going to are going to cover probably, I would venture to say, something out of 1 Corinthians 1, 29-31, which ends up uh, 29 and 31, the verses that capsulate the meat there, talks about boasting or glorying. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it one place. He that glories, let him glory in the Lord because of what's been accomplished by Christ. We know the rule that the new creature follows is the rule out of Galatians 6, 14, that God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the rule that they follow. Look at 6, 14 through 16 when you get time. So we see here our third glimpse of sanctification by sovereign grace. And we know this. We know about the Spirit. What's the Spirit do? What's His task? He testifies of Christ. And He's happy to do it. And when... The Spirit testifies of Christ to us, effectually, it sets us apart. And that's a work of the Spirit. We just, we're on the receiving end. We don't do anything to appropriate it. It comes to us by the sovereign work of God. And again, we see in this third facet or glimpse of sanctification by sovereign grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has preeminence. The Spirit makes sure of it because he testifies of Christ. So overall, let's just bring it to the question in reference to our latter part of this conversation of, of talking about sanctification and the law and works and things like this. We clearly, don't we clearly see that sanctification is not by works? I think some people in that are using some of our terms might go out on a limb and say, yes, sanctification is by works. Justification is not. Sanctification is. 
But I mean, that's pretty blatant, and I, I don't see that that often. But we know it's not. We, we've clearly seen that it's not. And if somebody can show me um, a verse they think saying that, I'd be interested in looking at it. We can talk about it. So I just said works in general, not by works. What about through the law? What about through the law? Are we sanctified through the law or by the law? I've heard some people say that. I've heard a lot of people say that. It's weird they would say that, but they wouldn't say we're sanctified. We're sanctified by works. I don't know what the difference is. But look at verse 31. Do we then make the law void through faith? God forbid. But we establish the law. Now, I want to give you a few ideas of, of some things I've seen over the years about what this text is not saying, some error that I've heard that you might look out for and watch out for. They would say what it means for us to establish the law is that they might think that by, and, and again, I'm, I'm kind of borrowing language from, from Rome's bad idea of infused righteousness and a cooperation to eventually get somewhere in sainthood. But they might say by enabling graces. And, and this is where it gets kind of subtle because they say it's all God doing it, right? They would say, well, even the Pharisee said that. I thank God I'm not like this guy over here that I'm better than. So he, he even gave credit to God. But these enabling graces, they claim that it's, it's, it's God working in me, and then I eventually get to the stage to where I'm keeping the law, I'm doing it better than before I was saved, right? I'm getting better. It's got to count for something, doesn't it? And that's what they mean, they to establish the law that way. Or they might go to rob an idea from um, Matthew 5, uh, that area there where it says that you have to have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes, the Pharisees, and they might match that up with this verse 31 and say, yeah, I, I, my righteousness exceeds it now because they didn't know what they were doing. I have the Spirit enabling me, and I have an enabling graces, and I'm doing pretty good with the law now. So it exceeds theirs, right? We're talking during uh, breakfast about that roller coaster of them doing pretty good, doing pretty good, and then boom, something happened. So you just got to make sure you die on that upswing. You don't want to die going down. So this, this, they claim, is holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. I think Bill's preaching on that um, in this conference. But that's what they say. This is the holiness I'm talking about that I'm involved with. I've got my hands in it, and it's progressing. It better be, or you shall not see the Lord, they say. So, my thought is, and I want you all to kind of go back in your mind and grab verses that you have heard and learned, of course, in their context, of seeing people make these mistakes, make these, take in these bad ideas. Paul, for example, said, uh, don't you hear what the law says? You're not, I don't think you're hearing the law. Because we know the law demands absolute perfection all the time, every time, without stop. The law demands we be just like the glory of God, who is Christ. So as they boast about being able to do these things with the law to end up to be in a certain 
to look a certain way to God in reference to acceptability. We look at that, I would hope that we would agree and look at that and say, you know what? That's cheap law. That's cheap law right there. You say we have cheap grace because grace does it all and we don't contribute to that grace. You say it's, it's uh, cheap grace because we, have, we haven't put anything into it. Well, we can turn around and say you have cheap law because, first of all, you don't understand the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the justice of God. You don't understand the depravity of man. They've brought God down. They've raised man up. It's cheap law. Their grace is cheap too. <laughs> They've got both, cheap law and cheap grace. And I want to bring it down to the bottom line here now. This is, this is it. The question I would say, look, is the death of Christ sufficient enough to save his people? That is the question, really. When you boil it all down, and you're trying to focus on the centerpiece of the gospel, the main thing of the gospel, is the death of Christ sufficient? Those that are trying to add works, to be accepted, saying they have a personal righteousness, a personal holiness, besides what they get in reference to God, you know, I'm accepted in Christ. No, I have a personal, and this is the one that if I don't have this, I'm not going to see the Lord. They're saying the death of Christ is not sufficient. I have to, and this goes back to the easy idea of, of conditions. That's a simple question to ask people to get them to think. And really what it boils down to is what's God said? What has he said? We've read what he says already about it. We've, we've hit three parts of it, by the Trinity. What's he said? And then do you believe him about what he said about it? Well, faith does. Faith does. And we're getting to this idea of faith establishes the law. Through faith, we establish the law. So we look to Christ. We look at him. What He, he put his hands on the law. He did something with it. Uh, he was born under the law, and he said, I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it in every jot and tittle. He kept the law, and we know that this wasn't just the letter of the law. This person is way different <laughs> than us, to where, you know, like Paul, when he was in false religion, he said, you know, according to the law, blameless. We're not talking about the surface stuff. We're talking about the will, the intent, the desire, the motive. Christ did it all perfectly. Uh, sinners, human beings, they can hide that stuff, and they can do outward stuff, and they can look clean on the outside. Christ was all in it, transparent. He kept it perfectly, every jot and tittle. He died under the penalty of it, the curse of it. And as he did that, he satisfied it. That's the propitiation. He satisfied the law of God completely. So God-given faith looks to Christ alone who can take care of that debt in reference to the law. Here's a couple verses. I'll quote them real quick. Two verses. I know you love them if you're a believer. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9.26. He put it away. You think he had to deal with the law in doing that? Here's another. He had by himself.